I'm not convinced it ain't no act in an accident with the track emits. You strap with gas that you ain't even practice with. The fact is, you couldn't hit the target. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. In this video, at some point, we're going to talk about NXT 2.0 from Tuesday, January the 18th, 2021. But we're going to push that review all the way back because they uh, apparently Walter has changed his name. The internet is on fire. And I have to admit, I'm kind of roasting on the Barbie too, man. You know, look. I, I think about things before I really react. I'm not a screaming, you know, maniac or whatever. There's very few times I'm going to get on here and just act a fool. Usually by the time I get to recording and everything, I've settled down. Um, so what happens? Walter has this really badass match with uh, Roderick Strong. He defeats Roderick Strong. The match was awesome. Go watch it. I will be watching it again. It was very good. And they didn't even do a lot in the match. It was just still very good, very hard hitting. Very professional stuff. After the match, Walter says that the winner of this match is Gunther. Um, earlier in the day, it was uh, apparently WWE had trademarked a name Gunther Stark. Um, and then some because people do this stuff because wrestling fans are nerds. Somebody Googled Gunther Stark and found that he was a Nazi U-boat captain from the 1930s or something to that effect and and so now people are wondering why would walter have the name of a nazi u-boat captain from the 1930s um apparently i'm looking at the the u-boat thing the website he died in june of 1944 so he's been dead for 70 years but he was, uh, yeah, he, he been, he's been dead since 1944, since the, around the end of World War II. So the guy's been dead for 70 years. I'm pretty sure nobody is looking for the, the connection. But at the same time, so now we have uh, just a lot of fireballs flying in the air at one time. There's a whole lot of Roman candles just going off at the same time. Some people are just mad about the name change. Regardless of what the name change is, that's I understand that. Some people are mad about the the name. It's a Nazi name. I don't. I think that one. That one's kind of weak. That one's kind of weak. And then there are just general hubbub around this whole ordeal. First, uh, let's let's take this piece by piece. The name change. Now, in NXT is kind of a ritual. That people, especially people from other countries, they come in and they pick their own names. That is the thing that people don't seem to understand is NXT always has these guys pick their own names. Apparently, Walter must have picked the name Gunter Stark. Um, maybe somebody didn't Google it, didn't care. Just looked to see if Gunter Stark was copyrighted. If not, we'll take it. Whatever the case may be. Um, of course, it's going to be a little, little weird because there's already a Zoe Stark on on the roster you can't have two starks and they're not related so that's going to be a bit of an issue unless he's just going to go by gunter that being said um to double back to what i said earlier we've seen it with oscar i think she was introduced as kana wasn't she and then uh, they revealed her name was oscar they introduced kenta as kenta and then revealed his name was going to be hideo itami they have done this stuff Several times, um, you had, uh, before he was Santos Escobar, he was, um, El Hijo del El Fantasma, the son of Fantasma, which is what he wrestled as in Mexico. He wrestled, you know, the Cruiserweight tournament as El Hijo del Fantasma and then unmasked and named himself Santos Escobar. This stuff happens. So the name change, while unfortunate... It happens. WWE does this stuff where they change people's names. It is what it is, right? I, I would have liked for him to pick a cooler name, you know, as, as rather than go with Gunter, because that's like the most, the most generic German sounding name, and it's very weird, and it makes him sound like he wears suspenders, 
and a uh, Coke bottle glasses. Like I, I, just, I don't think I've ever seen a, a badass Gunther ever. I don't think I've ever seen one. I don't think I've ever even heard of one. Um, at the same time, I'm going to assume that he picked his own name, and therefore, it is what it is. You know, I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Now, the like I said, the Nazi thing is probably incidental. You know, um, he's Austrian, which is kind of close to German. There is just just no way that anybody could have known that the guy was going to be some Nazi captain. And, you know, most of these names are names that people are, are picking either because it's close to them for some reason. So who knows? He might have a brother named Gunter. His dad might have been named Gunter. We don't know. I have no idea. Maybe he had a best friend named Gunter. Maybe the name has a meaning in Austrian. I don't know, you know, but usually that's kind of where, where things go is when they, when these people pick their own names, usually there's a reason for it. You know, when you had Kevin Owens, when he changed his name from Kevin Steen to Kevin Owens, he picked Owen because that's his son's name and he named his son after Orn Hart. So there it is. You know, sometimes you have to, you have to get your secret decoder ring out to try to figure out why they changed his name. Now, did Walter need a name change? No, of course he didn't need a name change. It's silly to change his name, especially since he's been all over NXT UK and all over WXW or VXV or whatever you want to call it as Walter. He's all over the internet as Walter. Why change his name? They change his name because apparently they're probably going to go in a different direction with the character. Now, now that he's full time on the NXT roster, they want to brand him. That's just what it is. They want to brand him. And part of that branding is changing his name. Now, uh, not thrilled about this, but it doesn't always affect how people see you. It doesn't always affect your character. It doesn't always affect everything. Like I said, sometimes people get, you get used to it almost immediately. Um, Oscar. I mean, a lot of people kind of resisted the whole Oscar thing. But now nobody even thinks of her as Kana unless you want to be one of these try hard, edgy, I only watch wrestling on YouTube and Daily Motion kind of guys. You know, some of the <laughs> those kinds of guys who continue to call, you know, who was calling Brian Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson when he first started in WWE and he continues to call they continue to call him that during his entire time in WWE. Because it's like, I know what his real name is. It's like, eh, who cares? I think we will all continue calling him Walter. I don't think anybody's going to really transition over to Gunter until, you know, it takes some time to get used to it. And I think that these kind of flare ups, they kind of burn out, you know, very quickly. Cause there's, they'll find something else to get upset over. And to be quite honest, there was a lot to get upset over on this show because I saw people get upset about Saray. So let's talk about that. Um, while we're here, they rebranded Saray. Now, Saray still has the same name, but she looks different. They changed Walter's name, but his look is the same. With Saray, they changed how she looks, but her name is the same. So they told the story about Saray uh, not having the greatest first year in NXT. So she went home to recharge and to mentally and physically, you know, get her life back together. And she found her favorite necklace. And her favorite necklace reminds her that she is the warrior of the sun. And pretty simple stuff. Not that big of a deal. But when she is on the screen, she has pigtails. She's wearing the big glasses. And she's clearly wearing a Japanese schoolgirl uniform. They have literally changed her into a Japanese schoolgirl. Now, me... And a lot of other people immediately start going, this is about to be some Sailor Moon shit. And I, I just got the feeling that she's about to go magical schoolgirl stuff. And people started to spaz out about Saray. What have you done to Saray? I'm like, we haven't done anything yet. We don't even know what's happening. All we know is her hair is a different color. Now it's in pigtails and she's wearing glasses. We don't know where it's going. To me, that I'm more concerned about the introduction of maybe magic into this. 
Because something tells me that the that the necklace is going to be magic. It's also might might be something that if it works out, they can sell some merchandise of that thing. So who knows? You know, she got a good little gimmick here. But I really want to see what's happening before I spaz out. Now the Walter thing, okay. Let's spaz. Let's let's act up because cha changing Walter's name makes no sense. It's completely stupid. Even though I know NXT does this stuff. They do this shit all the time. And that's really what's kind of tampering down, you know, from all the yelling and the screaming and everything that people are doing. I'm like, NXT does this. They do it to pretty much everybody. You know, when Tommy End shows up and he's Aleister Black, everybody hated that name too. Because he, remember, he debuted as Tommy End in NXT UK. And then he became Aleister Black. Um, Pac, I think he, didn't he debut, he didn't debut as Pac. I think he w was brought in as Adrian Neville. So, but everybody considered, knew he was Pac from the UK or whatever. So this kind of shit happens. Um, changing of the characters, changing of the images. WWE leaves no stone unturned when it comes to this stuff. Now, Walter, to double back to Walter a little bit. He has finished up, I believe, his commitments in Europe. He's done with the NXT UK. He had a tremendous match with Nathan Fraser on NXT UK. He's he's done there. And so he's, I guess, NXT full-time, which would explain the name change. It's going to be interesting how we explain why he decided to go with, with Gunter and what Gunter is supposed to be and where Gunther is supposed to go. Because I'm I'm really not. I'm not feeling the name. If he'd have changed his name to something else. You know something that was a little bit tougher. I don't know what a cool German name would have been. You know. But Gunther is not on the list of names. That I consider to be very cool. You know Walter is not really on that list either. But. If the guy doesn't change. And the only thing that's changing is his name. Then, okay. If we're going to continue with Walter being the, the big machine that he is. Alright, cool. Um, Then I'm cool with the name change. And I'll, I'll just learn to live with it. But if we're going to be changing a bunch of other stuff about him. I don't know, man. You know, like, I, like if, he, if he shaves his head or something like that. I don't know. Now, um. <laughs> to continue down the Walter, the Walter thing, the Nazis. Now I'm in, I fully support wrestling fascism. I, I like inappropriate gimmicks. I don't give a shit. People can be mad as they want. If they want to go full Nazi with Imperium, go for it. You don't, as long as they don't goose step or where, you know, the Sikh Heil and, you know, keep away from the swastikas and stuff like that. I'm 100% in. On them being like a dictatorship. You know. I am. I'm full on. With that. It could be fun. You know. Create. That's the thing about creativity. And a lot of these people. They, they claim WWE doesn't give people creative freedom. And there's no creative freedom. And it's like. Anytime they do anything. You try to stifle the creativity. By complaining immediately. Which is why I brought up Saray. It's like. I don't even know what she's doing yet. All we know is she's got this this necklace. It's very strange. They put a lot of emphasis on it. You know, uh, and they've changed how she looks. Not entirely sure what they're doing yet. But, all right, let's see where it goes. And that's kind of how, you know, you let creative people do them. If I walked in on half a painting, I'm like, what, the, what, the, what are you doing? You know, I don't know if you're drawing Spider-Man or porn. I have no idea what you're doing. It's not finished yet. You know, you're barely gotten started. So I'm just going to say, let some of this stuff, let it get started. And I saw the, uh, a lot of people was reacting to Alexa Bliss when she says for her segments, people need to let things play out. And they say, oh, we're tired of letting things play out. We're never letting things play out. The company doesn't. And it's like, well, look. You don't have a choice but to let things play out. You can choose to overreact and throw shit at the wall all you want. The story is not going to move no faster than it moves. You can only control the part of the thing you can control. 
which is why also why I'm not so mad about this. Story is going to unfold the way that it unfolds. If they explain why Gunter exists, why Saray is now a, a schoolgirl with magic powers, if that's the, the direction they're going in, then great. You know, that's really what I want. I want if you're going to change something, rebrand something, at least explain it. At least tell me about it. You know, don't just do shit. Like, if they'd have built up this Gunter thing by, you know, maybe, I don't know, promos or something, then okay, you know. But I noticed that there was already some changes in the Walter character before, you know, this name change. He was already talking more than he had ever talked before. The first several years Walter was on the WWE contract, he really didn't say much of anything. He would have, he was very terse with his language. And then near the end, once they would say like, oh, Walter's coming to the United States on a more permanent basis, all of a sudden he started cutting promos, <laughs> you know, like, like cutting regular promos. But I guess that was just in preparation for, you know, having to talk a lot more when he came to the United States. And he also lost weight. <clears throat> so he's taking this seriously, whatever it is. It's not just a, a, a pissy name change. And guess what? If it doesn't work. Then he can go back to being Walter and he'll still be the same guy that he was before, you know, which is why I don't really get too upset about the name changes. It's like, OK, if it doesn't work out, you can just go back to being who you were before and back to the independence where you were before. And, you know, no harm, no fall. Nobody lost anything. If Gunter sucks, then Gunter sucks. That's different from Walter sucking, you know. You can I can disasso dis dissociate those two. I can separate Walter and Gunter of Gunter sucks. I do it all the time. <laughs> you know, I I do it all the time. I I dissociate Bret Hart and WCW from Bret Hart and WWF. <laughs> I dissociate early Goldberg from recent Goldberg. You know, you know you you kind of have to sometimes, but. I'm in a position where I think that WWE leaves no stone unturned when it comes to changing and it really bothers people. And I, and I get it, you know, cause I'm not going to say it didn't bother me, but I, I don't think it doesn't make or break anything for me, you know, because I assume that the characters chose their own name. Therefore they're choosing their own fate and I'm okay with it. You know, I'm okay with that. I just want to know why he chose Gunter. And maybe he'll become a big star. Somebody will ask him on a podcast why he chose that name. And maybe he'll reveal that it's a best friend or something. Who knows? All right. So those are the two biggest news items. Now we can finally get into the NXT 2.0 review. And um, there's still some stuff I want to talk about. There's some extra stuff. There was a gentleman who went, who worked at WWE during the NXT, I guess you could say the Vince McMahon trip to the Performance Center. His name was Cornell Gunter. How how weird is that? We're talking about a Gunter, and this guy's name is Cornell Gunter. But uh, we'll, we'll see what Vince McMahon thought of NXT 2.0, or when he came up with it, what was his vision for it, and all this kind of stuff. We'll get into that later. You know, <laughs> so let's finally get into this show, NXT 2.0. We start the show with our boy L.A. Knight, yeah, who is uh, showing up to the show in a fly car. He told Chase U that stomping Waller's ass is going to be a teachable moment. Then uh, <laughs> he goes to the ring. He calls out Grayson Waller. He set up the story. That Grayson Waller has been bothering him and trying to get rid of him since Halloween Havoc. Uh, he says something about a young lady loving the Kavorka, yeah, of L.A. Knight. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds hilarious, and uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I don't even want to Google it. I just want it. To, I want the mystery because I want. I, I like it being funny. Um, L.A. Knight is in the ring waiting for Grayson Waller. Grayson Waller comes out right after L.A. Knight sets the stage. So L.A. Knight comes out there, tells the story of what's been going on from Halloween Havoc up to New Year's Evil. Then Grayson Waller comes out there. He's got a restraining order. And uh, L.A. Knight cannot be within 50 feet of Grayson Waller and said that he would love to fight him and kick his ass, but his lawyers have advised him against it and told him to get the restraining order, so he did. 
he sneaks up to the ring and kind of slides the restraining order in the ring so LA Knight could get it. So LA Knight has been served. The crowd is chanting rip that shit when he's talking about the <laughs> the restraining order. Why he didn't rip it, I have no idea. Um, in any event, while LA Knight is going through whatever he's going through with the with the restraining order, saying that, hey, basically, all right, you don't want to get me? All right, fine. But you ain't got no restraining order against him. And so Dexter Loomis crawls from up under the ring and attacks uh, <laughs> Grayson Waller. Grayson Waller kind of tries to escape. And now he's stuck in between Dexter Loomis and L.A. Knight. So L.A. Knight gives him a choice. He said, look, you can drop this restraining order and fight me right now in a match one on one. Or you can fight Dexter Loomis. But the choice is yours. And we went to commercial on that decision i like that i like that we went to commercial on a decision i like when we have to make decisions you know um characters are revealed in the decisions that they make so grayson waller chose to fight dexter loomis a very weird decision because dexter loomis controls zombies and he's you know a serial killer he has an axe you know why would you want to fight the guy who has an axe it's probably hiding somewhere with this axe you have the match um one thing i realized and i'm going to criticize grayson waller a little bit He's getting better shape. He's he needs to he needs to get it together. He's not he's not quite Adam Cole yet, but he needs to he needs to tighten up his uh his body. But um, Dexter Loomis has Grayson Waller beat. Um, Dex, uh, Grayson Waller is working the arm. You know, I'm also kind of weirded out by the Grayson Waller taunt, the kneeling taunt that he does, because I don't get it. I don't get the kneeling taunt. Sorry, change that. You know that's. One of the rookie things. I'm guessing he'll evolve away from that over time. Like sometimes guys start doing shit and they kind of move away from it later on. Hopefully that kneeling taunt that he does, we can move away from that. Um, So that some big dude, some big Indian dude, jumped the barricade and attacked Dexter Loomis outside the ring. And threw, uh, threw him into the ring post. Then Dexter Loomis gets thrown back into the ring. Only to find that Grayson Waller is in the, in the ring. He's he has to get a running start to do his tumble in between the ropes to do his stunner finisher. And I was like, I hate that fucking finisher. I, I hate that finisher. That's my that's my what fourth criticism of Grayson Waller. He needs to get in better shape. Stop doing that kneel and taunt and change his fucking finish. I got to go outside to get a running start to get back into the ring to do a stunner. Come on, man. You got to find a better way to ingratiate that move into your, like, I, I know that he likes that move and the move is cool, but we got to find a different way to ingratiate that move into our move set. That can't be the finish. That sucks. You know, it's too much going on. It's too busy. It's too busy. Find something else. It's, that should be easy. All right. So, um, because I'm lazy, I didn't really look the guy up, the big Indian. I found out that it's the other guy from Indu Share. It's not Veer Mahan. It's other dude. I, I don't know what his name is. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know what his name is. He looks a lot like Veer Mahan, though. Which is why I think they should probably, you know, cut one of these dudes' hair and shave him. Yeah, why we got so many guys looking the same around here? Come on. But uh, this guy, the big Indian, is Grayson Waller's insurance policy. I like that. I like that he has a heater with him. That's good. Grayson Waller has been, he's got a lot of enemies now. You know, he's a guy who could use a bodyguard. I like it. You know, so Grayson Waller is a good performer. Just some minor tweaks to his character. He's still in NXT. He's still in his pupil stage. He's not nowhere near finished, a finished product. But he's got the might skills. He's super annoying. He's actually over, believe it or not. A lot of people thought he would never get over. But he is actually over. People are definitely against him. And this thing with LA Knight has been a long-term story. It's been going on since October. It's been five months, I think. So it's looking good. Well, three months. Three months. So it's looking good. And they haven't had too many matches. So hopefully they can put that thing off as long as they possibly can. And maybe they'll both be in the Royal Rumble. Who knows? That would be fun to have so many NXT storylines mixed into the Royal Rumble. All right, so we already talked about Walter, so we're going to skip all the Imperium stuff. Uh, the Creed brothers defeated uh, Briggs and Jensen 
with a uh, basement lariat. The, uh, the, the real finish was a gun wrench into, I believe, like a, I don't know what the hell, torture rack slam. It was, it was wild. This match was pretty hard hitting. It was pretty solid. Dusty Classic is off to a decent start when it comes to this. Uh, Briggs and Jensen, later on in the show, they're licking their wounds and talking about how they have to go back to work and bounce back. And then in comes Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter, who just want to go party. They're like, look, guys, you guys lost. That sucks, but F it. Let's go party. You know, they got, and they're like, with you? And they're like, yeah. And then Wendy Chu, for some reason, is on top of the lockers. And is kind of instigating, kind of like, you know, kids do, you know, kind of out in that Jensen kind of got eyes for Caden Carter. I mean, who wouldn't? Caden Carter is a beautiful young lady. She she really is. She's a, she's a nice little young, looking young lady. And Jensen gets hyperverbal, which is always a sign of nervousness around young women. Oh, I like you, but I, I, not not like that. I mean, I was like, oh, no, you're a grown man, dog. You drink beer and such, right? Come on. Come on. Uh, anyway, that was weird. But they're continuing the storyline with them. I didn't think it was a storyline at first. I thought they were just doing stuff. Like, you know, they needed to bring them in to do something, and they just put them with the boys for a while. But now it seems like they're going to have a long-term storyline with Casey and Caden. Very weird. Very, very, very weird. But Wendy Chu was there, and people seem to like Wendy Chu. People seem kind of... All right. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of I'm ambivalent about Wendy Chu right now. Leaning more towards negative, but we'll see how it goes when she starts working more matches. Right now, though, as long as she stays out of the way, it's fine, and um, whatever. You know, I don't, I don't want her to do what she was doing. What was this, last week when she wrestled, and she was falling asleep in the middle of the ring, and you know, sleeping on the ring apron and stuff. I, I wasn't a fan of that. I mean, as a wrestler, she seems to be doing fine, but the character, mm, I don't know. I think we take things a little bit more seriously around here. Oh, Dante Chin who I forgot existed. Let's be honest. He was, I think, the first episode of NXT uh, 2.0, out of sight, out of mind. But he gave us an update of where he was. Apparently, Dante Chen got injured around the time of his first debut in September. And he'd been hanging out with his dad, rehabbing, getting, getting his stuff back together. His dad motivated him to get back into the gym and to really, you know, get back in the ring. Unfortunately, during the time of his injury and to, to this point, his father passed away. And he said while his dad got to see him make his debut, his dad never got to see any other match that he's done. And but he says that I got plenty more matches left for him to see. And I was like, okay, they went super babyface with this one. They went hard in the paint when it comes to babyface. They gave him a sob story. I I never want to see a guy lose if, you know, he's fighting for his dad. This is awesome. And then what they did. Dante Chen comes out there to wrestle Guru Raj. Guru Raj is another baby face. So they kind of slapped hands to start the match. Kind of a little code of honor thing. Then they both get jumped by Duke Hudson, who I didn't even recognize. I mean, I, it's just so many new faces popping up. <laughs> just... I was like, who the hell is this guy now? So, uh, Duke Hudson beat up both Dante uh, Chin and Guru Raj. Hopefully, Dante Chin wasn't hurt on the power bomb that he took. Because he it did look ugly. It looked ugly. But maybe he was just good at selling. Um, don't have anything against Dante Chin. You know? He looked very professional in his suit. You know? So uh, hopefully that, you know, he's got something. I really want something for him, for him to work out because, you know, it sucks to get injured really early. And we've seen a lot of the people who have come in along with him, Tony D'Angelo and Brian Breaker and Grayson Waller. They're three, four months in now, you know, so they're becoming pretty regular. He could have been in that class, but now he comes across as somebody who's again, he's starting all over. 
because all we've ever seen of him was his debut. So now he's got to start all over, but they threw him in the thick of things immediately by putting him in a feud with uh, Duke Hudson. Interesting story because Duke Hudson can't afford to lose and Dante Chin with this story of him, you know, wrestling for his dad and everything. I don't know if he should be losing, at least not right now, right? Uh, that doesn't mean he should be undefeated, but why not send him on a winning streak of like five or six matches first before we have him lose? All right, so we get Gacy and Harland. Uh, Gacy is wandering around with Harland backstage, uh, lamenting how they should be in the Dusty Cup, and he's very disappointed. But said, this is a time and opportunity for growth and development. They came across Odyssey Jones, who is uh, suffering a minor injury and decided to run his lips about (laughs) Gacy and Harland. Gacy opens the door for him to be a gentleman, of course. And then Gacy reminds Harland that certain things are a true measure of progress. Um, As (laughs) Harland breathes very heavily, Gacy's eyes is basically telling him to sick him. So, of course, we see later that Harland has done very terrible, horrible, very bad things to Odyssey Jones. And uh, I'm okay with this. Odyssey Jones, I don't know what's going on with him. It seemed for a time that he would be getting called up pretty early because he was doing dark matches almost immediately. He was barely on the roster yet. Um, Seems that they figured out he needed more season and sent him back down to NXT and NXT decided, okay, we're just going to put this big dude on the bench. Now, don't know if he's really injured. Maybe his injury is legit, but he's wrestled several matches that he lost that he probably shouldn't have, you know, against like Roderick Strong and guys like that. And you're kind of like, huh, why, why would you do that? But, you know, maybe it's just their way of testing him. But he has no character. He has no personality. He's very bland, but he has some size. Maybe he could have better gear, lose a little bit of weight, you know, get a little bit more muscle. But he's in his pupil stage as well. Everybody in NXT is pretty much, except for, you know, a handful of people who are, you know, mostly fully formed. Most everybody else is in their pupil stage. They're not where they would be in five or six years. So... You know, he's still got some work to do. Um, I like Harland and Gacy. They're lost in the shuffle right now. But at the same time, we're still seeing good character work out of both of them. So while it seems like they're just doing random stuff, like randomly attacking people, it still has an aura of menace to it. That is telling us that these guys, despite the fact that they aren't in a full-fledged storyline, they're a menace to the rest of the roster. All right, they're a problem. They almost throw a guy off the roof a couple of weeks ago. Now they've attacked this guy. They tried to kill. <laughs> they tried to kill Idris Enofe last week. It's like these dudes are a menace to the roster. All right, they're not in a storyline at all, but they're just like bad vapor. You know, they float and poison as they go along. And sometimes there's a little bit more intrigue there. But I do. I would like for them to actually work a full angle because I do like for Gacy to be able to cut his promos on somebody, you know, to sort of fully flesh out his ideas. But I like the Harlan and Gacy stuff, and hopefully Odyssey Jones can can benefit from this. You yeah. know, Brian Breaker, he's back there cutting the promo, and he gets he meets up with Electra Lopez, and he cuts her off almost immediately. He doesn't know what she wants, but he ain't interested. Then Santos Escobar. Tells him that he's not ready to lead the brand. And that uh, Brian is looking for a reason to put his hands on Santos Escobar. I was like, oh my goodness. But you know what was surprising to me? How Brian Breaker and Santos Escobar were around the same height. I, you know, Brian Breaker has this, this aura where he seems much bigger than he really is. Because Santos Escobar is not that big. You know, not just because he's a cruiserweight, but he's also kind of, I don't know if he's short, though. Is he six feet? Maybe. Maybe not. But Santos Escobar and Brian Breaker, of course, that's where the money is. That's a that's an oil mine right there. Um, this is, takes us to the Dusty Classic second match. Legado del Fantasma, who are the favorites, and not, and not only by me, but for apparently a bunch of other people, too, who just thought that Malik Blade and... Idris Enofe should just roll over and die. But they didn't. Uh, 
Santos Escobar was outside the ring interrupting this match. Then Braun Breaker came out there and collected him like a like a small child. This distracted Legado del Fantasma and Malik Blade and Idris Enofe win by distraction roll up to continue down the the roster down the Dusty Classic to the semifinals. Um, of course, Santos Escobar was being ejected anyway, but <laughs> uh, Brian Breaker decided to help him out in the matter. Later on, uh, Malik Blade and Idris Enofe are celebrating. They're super excited. Um, Brian Breaker went back there to celebrate with them, gave them all of the credit for winning, saying, hey, I didn't do anything. You guys did it. You know, hopefully you guys win the Dusty Classic or whatever. And I was like, okay. All right, this is the Cinderella team. This is, of course, it's the telling us. They, they barely survived Harlan and Gacy. They needed some help to beat Legato Death Fantasma. I get it. All right, this, this is your Cinderella squad. But eventually, Malik Blade's jobber status will become known and it's going to be over with, okay? But, um, I, I don't mind them getting the rub. You know, I don't mind these guys getting moved along. Because at this point, what this show was all about was setting up stories. This wasn't a work rate heavy show. Not at all. This was a show that is all about moving the stories along. The matches existed to move stories along. That was it. You know, segments all about moving stories along. So, speaking of segments moving stories along, Tony D'Angelo had a funeral service for Petey Poppins. (laughs) He gave him a eulogy. And there was this picture of Pete Dunn shrugging. And I was, I could not stop laughing at that very, just the picture of Pete Dunn with that, with that mean mug on his face and that shrug. I, I'm pretty sure that picture was from when he was doing the, uh, his tag team with Riddle. I'm almost certain that's where it came from, but it was, it's fucking hilarious. And <laughs> Tony D'Angelo called him pig headed and he had, he he had to learn the hard way. And, um, so he did, he changed his mind. He, you know, after he got done with his eulogy for PD Poppins was pretty short. Anyway, he starts talking about becoming the North American champion. And the moment he said that Carmelo Hayes and trick Williams showed up, (laughs) showed up in the, in the mezzanine like area. And they were pretty upset. Uh, Trick Williams did a lot of talking again. Uh, Mello was pretty pissed that Tony D'Angelo was coming for his title. And Trick Williams was like, I thought we was boys. And Tony D'Angelo was like, boys? I, I got boys. And he started naming all his boys like the hat and the sausage or whatever the hell. And they sitting up there listening to him. He was like... <laughs> And Trick Williams was like, I know all of your boys. I know about the hat and the sausage or whatever. They all skinny. They look like Vic Joseph. <laughs> I got lightheaded, bro. <laughs> like this dude, how could you be sitting in the ring with this guy? If I was Carmelo Hayes, I'd have been dead, bro. I'd have been. I would have had to hear that promo a hundred times in order to not laugh at it. Everything about it was fucking hilarious. Uh. <laughs> Carmelo Hayes once again got outshined by Trick Williams because he's trying to be serious. And Trick Williams is in a smoking jacket. <laughs> like you Hefner or some shit. And it was it was great. It was great. So Tony D'Angelo said they're not partners. Well, they, they were partners. They're not friends. They're not boys. And this is business. It ain't personal. Then Cameron Grimes comes out there. Cameron Grimes tells Tony D'Angelo to get to the back of the line. He's already challenged for the North American title, but he ain't heard too much from Carmelo Hayes. Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams said, that, okay, how about this? How about you two wrestle each other and I'll fight the winner? Cameron Grimes agreed with that, then said he was going to the moon and Tony D'Angelo tried to attack Cameron Grimes from behind. It looked like he might have had the crowbar. I'm not sure he had the crowbar or not. Um, Cameron Grimes ducked him and just blasted him in the head with this picture. And he was, he pulled the Vince when, when Vince got hit with the muscle and fitness picture. <laughs> he was sitting down like, oh, <laughs> uh, Tony D'Angelo got the same treatment. 
Um, I thought it was weird that he had a casket in the middle of the ring and nobody came out of the casket. Nobody got power bombs on the casket or nothing. It was just like a random casket in the ring. But uh, them hitting him with that picture was pretty funny. I like the idea of Cameron Grimes versus Tony D'Angelo. That match will actually be next week. That match is going to kick ass. That match is going to rule all ass. And I, I fucks with it. I really do. And I think that... um. Who, who do I think win? I think that Cameron Grimes wins. I think Cameron Grimes wins, but Tony D'Angelo doesn't let it go. And therefore, he's not going to get a, a fair number one contenders match. Maybe uh, Pete Dunne costs Tony D'Angelo the match. I know that him and Tommaso Ciampa have been working um, dark matches, but that doesn't mean they've been called up because Dakota Kai was working dark matches too, and she didn't get called up either. So that was fun. All that was fun. The one thing about NXT is I'm going to have fun with it one way or the other. There's always going to be some chaos. Speaking of chaos, uh, Valentina Faraz and Ulisa Leon introduced themselves as a new tag team. I don't know which is which. I know one of them speaks uh, Portuguese. The other one speaks Spanish. I think Ulisa Leon is, is the one who speaks Spanish and v Valentina Faraz is Brazilian. They both are legitimate athletes. They say they come from different backgrounds, but they have the same goal. And they're excited to be in the Dusty Cup. They have uh, formed the tag team. We'll be in the Dusty Cup. I was like, okie dokie. Sure, why not? Dakota Kai came out there hating friendship once again, claiming that nothing divides friendship like success. They got in her face. She ended up challenging them to a match. Well, one of them to a match. Uh, Dakota Kai ended up wrestling Julissa Leon um, and defeated her. After the match, she attacked Valentina Faraz too, but Valent uh, but uh, Leon pulled Valentina out of the ring, and they kind of put a little bit of a curse on uh, Dakota Kai. They're going to be doing something with them later. That ought to be interesting. I don't mind the tag team. I, I really don't. I think they they need it. The women's division really needs it. Um, Valentina Faraz, uh, despite the fact she's very generic looking, as far as I can tell, she wasn't wearing her usual getup. Usually she wears the, the gear with the, with the feathers and stuff on it. Without that, I just don't know who she is. But uh, she's a, they, they're both are legitimate athletes who are in WWE. And, you know, the, the language barrier is, uh, is is a real thing. I couldn't tell them apart and I couldn't understand what they were saying. You know, so that was that was very frustrating uh, on my end, but I don't have anything against them. Hopefully, they get to, hopefully they get their shit together. Okay, so uh, the internet kind of lost their mind for this next match, and I was ready to lose mine too. Kaylee Ray versus Ivy Nile. Now, Ivy Nile didn't get an introduction; she was just in the ring, right? So I'm thinking to myself, Ivy Nile is just going to do the job to Kaylee Ray because Kaylee Ray is supposed to be the next contender. They having the match, and the whole time I'm just kind of like, ah, oh, I cannot believe they put Ivy Nile in this situation and she's going to lose to fucking Kaylee Ray. And oh no, here comes Mandy. And he distracts Kaylee Ray as she was going for the gory bomb. She runs Mandy off, tries for the gory bomb again. Ivy Nile counters it into a roll up and pins Kaylee Ray. I was like, oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. The internet melted down because it, Kaylee Ray, who was supposed to be the top contender for the women's championship, just lost. And this is pretty much her second or third singles match on NXT. And uh, this led to, of course, the toxic attraction beating down Kaylee Ray. As uh, then uh, we had Indy Hartwell and Persia Parada come out there to help. Fight off Toxic Attraction, which is going to lead to a six-woman tag match next week. So Ivy Nile won a match with the help of Mandy Rose. And Kaylee Ray is still going to end up getting a match against the champion, but it's going to be a six-woman tag. And people are upset. Because they're like, oh, she's going to be a top contender for the title and she lost. I'm like, well, Ivy Nile was also a top contender for the title, you know. Which is why this match shouldn't have occurred. Um, but it also makes sense because... Mandy Rowe costing Kaylee Ray this match is a source of heat. You know, like before it was Kaylee Ray in the chase position. She was looking for Mandy. She couldn't find her. 
you know, so she busted up Mandy's photo shoot, you know, even though the, oh, she had, she was done for the day and was probably sitting by the pool again, sipping yellow daiquiris or, you know, lemon daiquiris or whatever. And now Mandy's like, oh, you're looking for me. I found you at the most inappropriate time, which is in the middle of your match. And then Kaylee Ray gets, you know, distracted. I still wouldn't have done it this way, but. I do believe that the internet is correct when it, when they talk about there's too many run-ins and too much of that kind of stuff. I agree, but NXT, this NXT episode was all about furthering the story. Ivy Nile winning wasn't even the focus of this match. The focus of this match was on Mandy Rose getting some comeuppance out of Kaylee Ray for Kaylee Ray wrecking her Photoshop last week, photo shoot um, materials last week. All right. Um, Solo Sokoa is saying that Boa isn't the only one who could call on his bloodline. They're going to have a no disqualification match next week. Uh, that has that has the potential to be fun. That has the potential to be fun. Not guaranteeing it. It's just got the potential to be fun. Um, they're doing their best to try to make Boa interesting, but they have to try a little bit harder. Uh, Raquel Gonzalez says that she's the Chingoa badass. She doesn't make excuses. But she still wants that title. Then Cora J says she wants the title too, but she also wants to be in the Dusty Cup. And Raquel was like, uh, no, I, you know, I'm not interested in that. You know, like we're, we were cool. We, you know, we worked as partners, but Hey, look, I'm, you're the reason I'm not the champion right now. So no, 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 no. And it doesn't seem like Cora Jade is ready to give up on this. And she will continue pursuing Raquel Gonzalez to be her tag team partner. And uh, look, Raquel has to do something. Cora Jade needs something to do. I don't know why they just don't call Raquel Gonzalez up and put her on SmackDown and have her beat Charlotte, you know, or, or at least throw Charlotte out of the Royal Rumble or something. There has to be something for the girl to do, you know. Instead of hanging around NXT, she doesn't need to be there any much, in that much longer. Um, but ultimately, the show, outside of the, some of the big changes, this show was all about moving along stories. There was no great big work rate stuff. This seemed to be the first episode of rebuilding after New Year's Evil. New Year's Evil was two weeks ago. And then the week after that, they had another big week with uh, Tony D'Angelo and Pete Dunne and then Grayson Waller and AJ Styles. So they had two straight big weeks with a lot of work rate stuff. So then they peeled back the work rate to work on the stories. You know, the stories took center stage this week. And in the stories taking center stage, you know, the changes that they're making to certain characters are absolutely taking people's attention away from everything else. But it's also good to see that people are engaged. They want to know what's going on. You know, not that many people talked about Saray at all. And then all of a sudden they saw that she looked different and people started bugging out. Like, oh, what are they doing? What are they doing? It's like they changed one thing about her and that's how she looks. And everybody is now interested in what's going on with her. What's this necklace all about? It's a lot more interesting than, hey, she isn't she a great Joshi Puroresu? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, aren't they all? <laughs> but now, like, she's doing something that's very interesting. Um, I don't think Walter needed the name change to be interesting, though, and to get, and, and I feel to that it might actually hold them back a little bit, you know, as the Walter name was becoming synonymous with a certain style of match and a certain. Um, and they, they brought that with Roderick Strong, but you know, they, they can, they can figure out how to fix it themselves. All right. So NXT 2.0 was all about storylines, not so much about the matches this week. So, okay, cool. But what was the, uh, the idea when it comes to NXT 2.0? That's what I want to talk about in this next part of this video is having done with the review. Now let's get into what Vince McMahon's vision was for NXT 2.0, according to Gunner um, Guy. All right, so let's talk about this uh, article here. It is a transcription uh, from Post Wrestling. The article is a transcription of Cornell Gunter, a former NXT video editor and content producer. Um, it was on, it was from the A Show from RNC Radio. So. 
he's going to explain what Vince McMahon's vision was, what the what the meeting was all about. The long and the short of it is that Vince McMahon, uh, Kevin Dunn, Bruce Pritchard, Triple H, and other luminaries went down to NXT, and they went to the Performance Center, and this is what uh, supposedly took place. Vince was talking a lot of great things. Like he talked about certain things, like how he wanted producers to challenge producers and coaches to think of matches differently. He wanted to challenge NXT to be different. He wanted to change the structure of NXT. And he said it then, and and I don't know how long ago it was. He said he wanted to change the look and the feel of NXT He wants it to be like NCAA type stuff. And I was like, I understand that. If his vision was 2.0, then there is a reason why he is who he is because 2.0 has been a breath of fresh air for the wrestling industry, period, especially for WWE. So that's what he's talking about. Um, Vince wanted it to feel more like the NCAA. Um, A more college sports kind of thing. I don't know if they they hit that right note, but I I think I get what he's what he's saying here, and uh, that makes sense. So he continues, when the whole Vince meeting happened, and he did come down to the to the performance center and talk to us for two hours. He did go to the other PC and do a tour and look at certain talent over there, and like I said, Kevin Dunn and Bruce were there. People were excited because at that time a lot of the new new talent like Carmelo Hayes. And all of them were fresh in in a, a couple of months. So this is the first time they probably was crossing paths with Vince. So the energy in the building wasn't like, oh my God, my parents are home. It was more like, I'm just here to see what's up. What's going on down here? And then he, later he says, when Vince came down, he basically told people his history of wrestling and why he loved it and what made him get into it. And then that segued into WWE as it is today and the stuff that he wants to see in the future. Then he says, uh, he said that him and Hunter talked about it for X amount of time. And the guy then continues, everyone's now talking, making these little jokes about Hunter. And I'm going to tell you right now, the man is one of the genuine and brightest. I don't know how many adjectives I can use to describe somebody in a positive light. I'm just going to tell you right now, that meeting was never any type of disregard or disrespect to what Hunter has done. Um, what Triple H has done at all. It was definitely something where it seemed at like a unified vision where everybody's on the same page and everybody's understanding and everybody's going towards the same goal. Again, that meeting was something where if he was challenging even people like myself who was producing and shooting content to shoot stuff that was different and think outside the box and try to go back to basics in terms of wrestling. So he's talking about producing um, better segments and trying to be a little bit more original while also paying homage to the, um, to the way things are supposed to be done. But do, you re- do we realize that this passage basically you know, defeats the internet uh, narrative? that Triple H has basically been bullied out of his job by Kevin Dunn and Bruce Prichard and all these guys. This dude who worked there says, it seemed like a unified vision to me. Didn't seem like they were disrespecting what Triple H has done at all. I mean, very interesting. This is a guy who, if you just want to look for a little bit more color, they talk about it in this transcript as well, that he was the guy who shot, you know, he helped shoot the Boneyard match. He helped shoot one final beat to Maso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano. He helped shoot the street fight between Velveteen Dream and Adam Cole. So he was working and doing the cinematic matches during this time. So he was present when Vince McMahon went to the Performance Center and says, hey, we basically just got a lecture about all the things Vince wants to do. And Vince wanted a more NCAA style show that challenged producers and cameramen, etc., to do things that were different while also maintaining some of the classic wrestling ideas. And that that's not sexy. That's why you probably never heard it anywhere else except here. I certainly didn't hear anybody else talking about it. 
outside of this particular article on post wrestling, I didn't see it anywhere else. That Vince was basically just looking to create an NCAA for WWE, which, if you think about it, makes perfect sense considering it dovetails nicely with the introduction of their NIL program, which means it probably was created around that same time. Uh, I think the NIL thing was announced in, in May of 2020. It, maybe I think it might have been in 2021, actually. But, um, yeah, they were discussing this sort of thing before it really became public. And, you know, Nick Khan keeps his fingers on the pulse of all pretty much all major sports. So they've been talking about NILs since 2019. I do know that. So the NIL lawsuits and everything has been, you know, floating through the courts. It was floating through the courts for over a year. So no doubt Nick Khan knew about it. And no count, no doubt knew that we could prepare for it. Now, things looked when we were seeing people disappear that things were happening very fast and seemed to be happening hap haphazardly. But that doesn't mean that just because it seemed that way to us that they hadn't thought about this long before they actually did it. Now, maybe they didn't have all the pieces that they need. And there are certainly going to be some things that are, you know, not going to work out the way that they thought. Your, your ideas are always perfect. Your execution is always going to be a little off. But I can definitely understand if Nick Khan, who we know, if we listen to the the um, the earnings reports, he's always talking about the deals and the business of other businesses, of Netflix, of NBC, of the NCAA, of NASCAR. He's paying attention to all that stuff. So if he knew that the NCAA rules were probably likely to change and he was like, hey, we can get in on the ground floor. And then they announced the NIO program. What? Literally 60 days, maybe not that much longer after NXT 2.0 was launched. They have an NIO class. And then this is, you know, Vince is talking about having an NCAA style system in NXT. That was, of course, going to change the entire nature of what NXT is. So, wow. I mean, what's the likelihood of all of this stuff coming together and it not being planned? That it just being serendipity that this uh, Gunter Scott, or whatever his name was, Cornell Gunter, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting what the guy's name is because it's the same as Walter's new name. But um, what was the likelihood of this Gunter dude saying that Vince wanted an NCAA style show that was shot differently, that, you know, had still had some traditional tropes to it, but <clears throat> was produced a little bit more differently. And, you know, and for people to be a little bit more creative in how they were doing things and to eliminate certain tropes that he had also saw a lot of, like how, you know, we shoot guys getting back in the ring and stuff like that. What was the likelihood that Vince uses the term temple NCAA style while also, hey, the NIL program is going to come up, you know, literally. And then we're going to announce our first NIL class not long after NXT 2.0 begins under construction. Very, very strange stuff. Since I don't believe in too many coincidences of this magnitude, I got a feeling that maybe Nick Khan went to Vince and Triple H and said, hey, you know, the structure of this of this whole business is about to change. You know, instead of bringing in 36 year old rookies, essentially, and trying to teach them how to do what we do, why not bring in kids, you know, teach them how to do what we do. And in order to make them feel comfortable, create an almost college like atmosphere with NXT. Cause then it makes sense because you have a uh, Andre Chase on there. <laughs> <laughs> with the with the chase you thing, I mean, it all just seems to dovetail nicely in a way that it almost seems planned. And, and so that's interesting to me, and I thought that it might be interesting to you too. So we covered a lot of subjects here. We covered uh, Saray's new change, we covered Walter's new name, we covered this Gunter uh, Cornell Gunter blowing up the internet narrative that Triple H has been kicked out and uh 
his 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 home has been run over and destroyed and now it's being paved over because the guy who worked there and who has who does not work there anymore he doesn't work in wwe anymore i think he was one of the guys released from the original nxt releases um his 90 days still isn't up yet according to the uh transcript so he has no reason to to lie or to continue talking about this whole thing you know so what more is there that needs to be said triple h was not forced out the vision of triple h was merged with the vision of you know vince and nick Khan and all those guys and they decided they needed a more direct offshoot from nxt to wwe i mean if you look at the black and gold even the match style and the match thing, the way that people performed was different. Guys were known to be working a faster match style in NXT. And then you had to come to Raw or SmackDown and you had to slow it down. You know, that's a a whole new change to what's going on here, you know? So it's a lot of a lot of little interesting tidbits I think we talked about in this thing. So let me know what you guys thought of this video. Um like Share and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Thank you. Peace and blessings. And um, see y'all next time.